Good evening. My name is Dr. Jing Wen Lin. I'm an obstetrician and gynecologist at the Pacific Women's Healthcare Associate here in Newport, Newport Beach. Today, I'm pleased to speak with you about a very common gynecological condition that affects women throughout their life, painful period. I'm sure a lot of our audience have experienced themselves, their daughters in all ages. So um, let's get started. So the medical term for painful period is called dysmenorrhea. Dysmenorrhea is often underreported and undertreated. The prevalence range, as you can see, it can go from 60 to 93% in the adolescence. Um, and then about 15% describes them as very, very significant that limits their ability to function, to go to work, to go to school, for their daily lives. Um, and many of them has to seek for medical advice. So on a daily basis, you know, I see patients in my office, and even though for regular visits, but a lot of times they will say, you know, my periods are getting more painful, and what's going on? Um, and then for the primary dysmenorrhea, which the definition is that there's this recurrent crampy lower abdominal pain that occurs during menstruation. And there's no underlying uh, pathology that we can, we can find. And usually, classical symptoms starts um, for, because it starts during ovulation cycles of women. So a lot of the teens, when they're just starting their periods, this pain doesn't start yet because this ovulation cycle usually starts within a few months, up to two to four years after the cycle then become ov ovulatory. Um, these pains, the good news is that as women gets older, these primary dysmenorrhea gets better. And after sh she's had children also, these pains get better. Um, the pain starts right before menstruation or at the onset of the period. And usually, they don't last more than three days. And the pain is usually in the lower abdomen and usually can radiate into the lower back or the inner thigh. And these pain tend to be episodic and crampy in nature. Um, and they are associated with nausea, vomiting, bowel movement changes, fatigue, headache, dizziness, sleep disturbance, and even depression. So the menstrual flow itself can be normal, light, or heavy. Um, and then actually there's no specific test or diagnostic tools, ultrasounds, uh, for the initial um, e evaluation or um, even starting a treatment. Because by a comprehensive medical and menstrual history, we can already pretty much diagnose for primary dysmenorrhea. However, if there's any atypical presentation, um, s there are some abnormal physical findings or if patient already tried um, some treatment, however, it's not getting better, then we should look for other causes, which are the secondary uh, dysmenorrhea. And typically in young teens, we do want to rule out anatomical uh, abnormalities. Um, there might be blockage in their uh, reproductive tract that's causing um, these pain, cyclic pain. Sometimes the pain even start before the actual menstruation, so that's a really a, a good cue that there could be some anatomical abnormality. So these, a lot of times, needs to be surgically treated. Um, other things, pelvic infection, uh, there are other conditions called endometriosis, ovarian cysts, 
uh, uterine fibroids, we'll discuss a little later, or it could be some non-gynecological causes, um, or sometimes could be psychogenic dis uh, contributors. So next, we'll discuss a little bit about the pathophysiology um, of primary dysmenorrhea. And uh, you can see a very busy slide uh, on the right side here. It starts with um, excessive production of this uh, signal called prostaglandins, especially prostaglandin uh, F2 alpha. So prostaglandin are a group of lipid compounds that are involved in multiple phys physiologic as well as pathologic conditions in our body. And sometimes there's excessive of the prostaglandin uh, F2 alpha or the ratio of the prostaglandin E2 is altered, then causing the poorly coordinated uterine contractions, which increase uterine muscle tone, decrease blood flow, causing hypoxia, which means lack of oxygen, and ischemia, lack of blood flow to the uterus, causing local inflammation reaction. And these reaction it stimulates the pain receptors then lowers the threshold for the pain perception, thus causing the pain. Um, and then some of these mediator also uh, acts on the surrounding pelvic organs in your intestines, then it causes those nausea, vomiting. Um, some of them even can travel to the brain, causing fatigue, dizziness. Um, there is a uh, right. There's um, it can cause what's called a central sensitization, um, causing the um, pain hypersensitivity, um, then leads to the long-term chronic pain syndrome, sleep disturbance, and depression, and reduction of quality of life in general. So now we know the main cause for the primary dysmenorrhea. This leads us to, um, to the main treatment, which is try to interfere with the production of the prostaglandins. Um, so as most of us know, heat, heating pads, uh, works really, really well. Um, some people, a lot of women have these electrical blankets, you know, uh, put it right around the pelvic uh, lower abdomen area during the menses that really, really helps with the, the, the menstrual pain. Um, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, uh, short for NSAIDs, are the one that can help to reduce the prostaglandins. Um, so they are considered the first line of treatment. And they are available over the counter. So ibuprofen, for instance, um, the brand name is called Motrin or Advil. Um, these medication, because you want to really stop the prostaglandin reduction, so you want to start taking it, taking them one to two days even before menses start. And because we know these are all of ovulatory cycles, so they, are, they should be regular menses, so you can kind of figure out when the menses is supposed to be starting, and you want to start uh, taking this medicine a couple days ahead of time, and also take it scheduled. Don't wait until pain gets too strong. Then um, a lot of times, um, it's just like a waterfall. It, um, the pain just harder to salvage. So the typical dosage for the ibuprofen, um, they usually come in 200 milligram tablets. So you can start with 800 milligrams so of four, four pills uh, initially, and then you can continue with 400 to 800 milligrams every eight hours. Um, another one, naproxen, which is Aleve, um, they come in 220 milligram tablets. You can take that initially and then take it every 12 hours. So one benefit of naproxen is um, it's you don't need to take it as often. Uh, for this medication, because the side effect of the medicine, it may cause uh, GI um, irritation, uh, stomach ulcers, so you do want to take with food, okay? Um, there are a couple other um, over-the-counter medication, uh, Midol or Pamperin. So these are 
acetaminophen based or Tylenol based. So there are some people cannot take NSAIDs because of uh, allergies or because they are uh, sensitive to the stomach. Um, so acetaminophen is a pain modulator. And then the second component of Midol is caffeine. Caffeine is a diuretic. So that helps to reduce the uh, swelling some people uh, experience around the period of time. And then the third component is a antihistamine, the pyrilamine. Um, so these are most people already trying before they even come to see me. Um, we do have prescription um, strength uh, anti-inflammatory medication that we use quite, uh, actually works really well. Um, one is called Ponsto or mephenamic acid. They come in 500 milligram initially, and then uh, you take 250 every six hours. Um, if someone does have some GI side effects, so Celebrex works really well. Celebrex are used a lot in arthritis because uh, of the, um, it's specifically for the COX-2 inhibitors, so it doesn't affect the stomach as much. So usually though, uh, Celebrex comes in 400 milligrams initially, and you take 200 milligrams every 12 hours. All right, so next, um, a lot of these anti-inflammatory medicine may not be sufficient. So we talked about the, the main causes for the primary dysmenorrhea is due to ovulation. Um, so we can use hormonal options also because it can inhibit the ovulation and also reduce the, uh, the endometrial lining from getting too thick. So when it sheds, and then you can produce more prostaglandins. So we have many, many options. We have pills, we have ring, implants, injection, intrauterine device. And these are good options for cer certain uh, women because some women may need contraception. Um, some of these um, hormonal options can also help to lighten the menstrual flow, help with acne control, help with premenstrual syndrome. Um, so many women sometimes can choose um, these options rather than have to take another uh, pain medication or other things. Um, because for ovulation, for instance, for the pills, we ca they can come in monthly or they can come more extended release. So every three months or even you can skip the placebo so that you don't even have a menstrual cycle, then definitely the dysmenorrhea will not occur or much less. And um, some women starts with continuous birth control pills for a little while and then once those symptoms get better, um, they can decide to stop or just use it more um, on the regular cyclic ways. Um, there's a hormone option, but it's not considered birth control. Uh, we use what's called norethindrone, five milligrams, and it's a progestin only. So if someone cannot take uh, estrogen for different reasons, this is a really good option. Um, it's five milligrams daily. It, uh, that really can also help to suppress the, the ovulation and suppress the pain. Um, if we have other options and really also ha there's some good study to show efficacy to help with, uh, to c for the pain, it's called uh, transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation. So what it is, um, it can tell, it's, usually, it's a e electrical stimulation. Usually you put a two little electrical pads right above the uh, suprapubic area and it sends the high frequency signals, basically drowns out these pain sens sensors so your body don't, f don't feel it. Um, so think of it as a child doesn't want to listen to their mom and, and they just go ah all the time. So then they don't, <laughs> so, they, so they, they can't uh, receive the signals, the pain signals from, from, the, from the lower pelvic area. So that's one, uh, we think how the, uh, the uh, ten units works, and second uh, way how it may work is it can help your body to release the 
your own endogenous uh, and endorphins. Endorphins are these hormones that help you feel good about yourself, and it helps uh, the well-being uh, feels of, of the well-being. So um, the tensioners can help with that. And also, uh, directly, the tensioners can reduce the muscle uh, spasms and also increase the blood flow to the pelvic organs. So that helps a lot. Uh, and then many people also seek complementary and alternative therapy. Um, one really good one, especially for pain, is acupuncture and acupressure. Um, there are many, many studies. However, uh, acupuncture and acupressure is very difficult to study. And because there's just different, many different, um, widely different designs, how it uses and, and different points. So, um, but there are definitely good little, uh, good points. Um, and for many, for some people, it does help a lot to reduce their pain. Um, alongside with that, exercise and yoga and also can help. A lot of women tells me if they um, just worked out more regularly and they find that their menstrual uh, period pain is much better. How does it work? Um, we think it, it, again, increase the blood flow and endorphin release uh, to the pelvic organs and also works well for stress and anxiety. Um, so, so as you can, um, Earlier, um, a lot of these conditions, there's, there's another theme underneath um, what causes the painful period of dysmenorrhea is not just the prostaglandin, a lot of these secondary dysmenorrhea, now we're gonna talk about, um, it has to do with our imbalance, our hormones. Um, a lot of us, because uh, our ovaries, produces two main hormones, estrogen and progesterone. There's constantly this balance between estrogen and progesterone. Um, so we talked already earlier, we talked about the pelvic disease that can cause a secondary dysmenorrhea and then the anomalies um, that sometimes may need surgery. But then the next big topic is endometriosis. Endometriosis can even occur in adolescents and it's one of the most common causes of, of secondary dysmenorrhea. And it, it's reported about 10% of the reproductive women in globally may suffer from endometriosis. And usually though, the endometriosis is not cyclic pain around period time. Um, it gets worse around the period time and many of them have chronic pelvic pain in the area and also can eventually lead to uh, infertility and other um, reproductive health issues. Um, and then as we get older, there's another condition called adenomyosis. Adenomyosis, I see it as a cousin uh, as of endometrial. So what happens is the endometrium, the inner lining of the uterus um, for endometriosis, it starts growing outside of the um, uterus. For adenomyosis, it starts growing into the muscle layer of the uterus. And typically, um, this one, it associated with heavy uh, menstrual flow also, and may or may not have chronic pain in nature. And these pain tend to be more dull rather than uh, uh, would be spastic. Um, so, um, so these are things that we need to rule out. And all these topics could be a whole new talk about how we can recognize it, how to diagnose it, and how to treat it. Um, same thing with fibroids and ovarian cysts. So as you can see, the, there's that underlying theme of um, some people may have, can hear, may heard of the term estrogen dominance. Um, and um, because of the, as that's why these secondary dysmenorrhea usually happens later in life as it accumulates uh, in our body. So um, in the last part of my talk, I just want to maybe focus more on nutrition and lifestyle changes that's so important um, and may help 
to even prevent some of the secondary dysmenorrhias and also treat uh, the primary uh, dysmenorrhea starting uh, at our younger age. Because we know um, the, there's study that look at women who doesn't have a uh, painful period. And then when they look at their diet, those women, their diet are much higher uh, in intake of zinc, beta carotene, and vitamin E. Um, and these good sources for the zinc include uh, red meat, pumpkin seeds, for beta carotene, and as the name, um, carrots, sweet potatoes, these uh, orange and red uh, vegetables, peppers, and also even in dark green leafy vegetables. Um, then there's some very, some very good study, even for primary dysmenorrhea, using vitamin E, about 200 international units twice daily. Um, Again, try to start two days before actual menstrual starts, and then continues for about three days uh, during the menstrual uh, bleeding. And then a lot of times, um, these pains is better because vitamin E is a very potent antioxidant. Uh, B, vitamin B1, B6, and these are the B vitamins. B vitamins are very, very important in helping energy uh, production and also support our digestive health to help our skin, our hair, our liver health, and also even help to buffer us against stress. And um, vitamin B6 works very closely to ma with magnesium. Uh, magnesium, um, a lot of us take for muscle cramps, uh, you know, uh, Epsom salt bath is magnesium. Uh, because it really, really helped to relax us. Also, um, there's good study using magnesium glycinate, 100 milligrams every two hours at the onset of your menses cramping and uh, can help with the dysmenorrhea. Uh, magnesium can also help with other PMS symptoms, for instance, to help sleep better. And some people take magnesium at night and um, some people take it for anxiety. Um, so, and also can help to reduce migraines. So, so magnesium, vitamin B6, okay. Um, and all these, what I just mentioned, uh, circles back to, for your hormones because these vitamins can also help your body to produce, produce progesterone to counterbalance the excessive um, estrogen. And that helps with ovulation and with reducing of the prostaglandin productions. Um, I know I can go on and on about these supplements. Um, a good one also is uh, ginger. Ginger uh, up to 750 to 2,000 milligrams daily um, can help. They, they can come in tablet forms uh, or teas or just uh, uh, you can cook use in your cooking. Uh, cast castor oil packs. Castor oil, this is the really ancient uh, old remedy and you can rub it on your abdomen and then you put a soft uh, cloth like flannel and then you apply heat uh, that these can help to so we already know the heat helps to help with the cramps but also study shown it can help with liver cleansing with uh, digestive uh, health and also can help to reduce stress and anxiety. Um, and fennel, fennel is a, so fennel seeds for instance can help with the, with the intestinal cramping and bloating. So, um, so all those uh, in the long term will help overall health and also with the hormone balance and then eventually leading to a, a better menstrual cycle and less pain with each cycle. One other thing before, um, so talking about lifestyle changes is um, if possible to reduce plastics, uh, especially use uh, plastic food containers because 
even we we know plastic is not good for the environment, but it's not good for our, our body also, because when especially heated up, heating up food in the plastic or water, or in in the the water in in the um, it seeps into our bodies and also um, they act as endocrine disruptors. So that again can disrupt our normal hormone milieus in our body and causes havoc in our body. And the last but not least, try to relax, try to reduce stress because uh, the stress hormone cortisol, believe it or not, actually shares the same synthetic pathway as progesterone. So sometimes when you're more stressed, what happens, your body is trying to swipe away the progesterone then to make more cortisol down, downstream. Um, then that will put our ovarian hormones out of sync. And the cortisol also uh, can suppress our pituitary gland, which is your body's master glands in the brain that controls activities for most of our hormone secreting glands. So that will affect our thyroid, our insulin that controls our sugar, and of course our sex hormones, the progesterone, testosterone, and estrogen. And try to get good night's sleep at least every seven to eight hours. Take a nice warm bath trying to listen to some calming music before go to bed rather than trying to check your emails and already stressed out about tomorrow, you know. And uh, practicing mindfulness, um, meditation, say a prayer before you go to bed. All these things in long term will improve your, your life, your health, and your spirit. Thank you very much.